Thank you very much. Um, it's a great opp opportunity to be here. When I first joined ODI, um, I did contribute, um, I think, a background paper back in 2007, um, working with some of Ludo's um, comments. I haven't read a report since then, but I did definitely read this one. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to pick up on a couple of points, some of uh, which are highlighted in the um, executive summary. There were kind of, I mean, I don't think anyone in this room would really disagree with the main argument made in the report regarding the role of, of the manufacturing sector in terms of sustaining structural change and so on. I, I don't think anyone would really disagree with that. But the question um, that, that we face and uh, that we try and address is how, um, because for least developed countries, which the report does make specific reference to with regards to the textiles and clothing industry and agro-processing, or those, that those industries are argued to have immense potential. The question that we always try, try and answer here is, you know, well, how do countries engage? How do they obtain that type of manufacturing? Because the textiles and clothing industry is typically offshored, um, or you can outsource, lead firms outsource um, as well. Or how do you move up the value chain into agro-processing, so from just basic production of commodities and so on into uh, more processing? So the question that comes to my mind is, you know, I, w I wouldn't disagree, but the question is, you know, well, well how? And um, I understand that that's not necessarily in UNIDO's remit to answer that question. But um, I think in my presentation, I do echo some of the points that were made earlier by um, Zaolin regarding the type of firms that are involved in these types of activities and the type of the types of kind of capabilities that they, they might develop. Um, and if, if you take the global value chain uh, perspective, you know, we are operating, uh, LDCs face quite a different trading um, environment to that faced by um, China as it industrialized other East Asian countries. You know, we're living in a world in which around 70% by the latest estimates of global trade is controlled by transnational companies and so on. So in some cases, in, in some cases, upgrading within value chains also means trying to obtain some of the controls and functions that are um, that the lead firms actually control. So I just present a, a small graph here. So what what this this graph shows um, is that it's, it's kind of thinking about moving up up the value chain. So if you're you can go from just designing a product. Um, towards manufacturing, towards its sales and marketing. Um, but what, what's happened in recent years is as we've had this kind of shift in global manufacturing, you know, the, the, the share of developed countries in manufacturing has declined, but world manufacturing has increased as you have uh, the entrance of new players such as China and so on. Some have argued that that's, that means that the, the kind of value-added share from activities such as manufacturing has actually declined over time. And, and we know from our work here that you know, LDCs such as Bangladesh, Cambodia, Lesotho, Lesotho you know, they're already involved in the textiles and, textiles and clothing value chain, but it's very, very <laughs> tough for them. Um, you know, they do face quite fierce competition from Chinese producers and, and so on. Um, and they face challenges in terms of trying to upgrade within that, that value chain, as was mentioned earlier um, in the present uh, by, by Dirk Willem. So when, you, when we're thinking about um, upgrading, you know, we are thinking about obtaining not only more functions such as manufacturing within the value chain, so moving from just commodity production towards processing and so on, but we're also thinking about services. And one thing that came to my mind uh, when reading the, the report was that it's actually less favourable regarding the role of services for LDCs than it is for uh, developed countries. But increasingly, we're taking a kind of whole of supply chain approach whereby, you know, services and, and manufacturers manufacturing, it's kind of an independent process. If you're going to succeed in, in value chain <coughs> development, you need to consider kind of both of those, those aspects. So that was a little bit... Um, you know, I, I, I found that point a little bit contentious. And um, when you think about uh, LDCs, you know, it's not a, there's, it's a, actually a very diverse group. So you have, uh, you know, the Pacific countries. Are they really going, LDCs in the Pacific, are they really going to go into 
textiles and clothing. I mean, it hasn't happened to date. They've had favourable market access. They don't have the productive capabilities. They don't have the scale um, and so on. I mean, not even McDonald's goes to the Pacific. I mean, that's how that's what we're we're, we're talking about. Um, so that is a real challenge. Agro processing, yes, but but for what market? And and I, I would have liked to have seen more of a focus on a kind of market orientation because. We, we kind of move beyond the debate about in import substituting industrialization, export orientated industrialization. I mean, we all understand the pros and cons of each, and that it's better to shift towards an export orientated industrialization strategy. But what markets? Because if you're dealing with global trade and global value chains, you know, you're dealing in, it's a very tight market, you know, it's very tightly controlled and so on. Maybe the domestic market might offer more opportunities or intra-regional markets and so on and, and so I didn't really get that it wasn't coming out of the report so I would have preferred a kind of more disaggregated analysis and, and I understand it's beyond your um, remit to some extent but you know more of a focus on the firm the types of activities um, the types of markets that could be targeted uh, and so on um, so yeah I think I mean, I mean it's also services such as tourism I mean it wasn't mentioned in the report, but that that sector's you know it's quite big in many LDCs that I've visited, and it does have linkages to the manufacturing sector, and they are often very underexploited. You know, even things like cement producing for building hotels. You know, firms in 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 Korea, for example, some of the big firms nowadays that we know did initially start out doing some very basic cement production and then they've subsequently upgraded their skills and moved into <coughs> other areas as well so kind of a more of a focus on you know um those industries i mean those are the kind of industries that come to my mind not necessarily textiles and clothing and agro processing but i understand where you you've got that impression from your your presentation um but uh, yeah um yeah, so I, d I, you know, I don't agree with your main argument, but I think more of a disaggregated analysis, the types of LDCs that we're talking about, the types of firms, types of activities that we're talking about, um, and then the types of upgrading strategies might also be helpful. Um, and, and thinking about manufacturing and services as separate is not really helpful um, when you're thinking through firm-level upgrading strategies. Um, I've got two graphs here, two uh, charts here that just show that upgrading does mean obtaining more of these functions, including services such as, you know, getting control of marketing, retail, uh, and so on. And this, this second graph here now is for um, agro-processing type uh, activities.